Hi everyone, and welcome to Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. I'm the resident naturalist. With Explore, we have more than 180 live cameras all over the world, but perhaps our most famous cameras are located at Brooks River in Katmai National Park, where we can watch brown bears fishing for salmon. And it is a season of hunger and desperation for many bears because there's not a lot of salmon left in Brooks River and the bears are trying to put on the last uh, amount, amounts of fat that they can before winter hibernation. So it's a really vital time for their survival. And to help us talk about that, I'm joined not by one, not by two, but by three Katmai Rangers today. And I'll go in alphabetical order according to last name. First, I'll introduce Park Ranger Naomi Boak. Naomi, how are you? Um, I'm very well. Um... This is great to have all of us together on this play-by-play -play tonight. Yeah, I think we'll have plenty to talk about. And of course, uh, joining me also is Park Ranger Felicia Jimenez. Felicia, how are you today? I'm doing well. Yeah, it is so beautiful in Brooks Camp right now. It makes me really happy to be looking at this. And finally, uh, I think you're happy to look at this as well, uh, Chris. And uh, my third co-host is Park Ranger Chris Kleesrath. Chris, how are you? I'm doing great. And uh, I wish I was actually there seeing it in person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this would, be, this would be an absolute great day to be at Brooks River. Uh, you'd have to dress warm. There was uh, frost, of course, on the mountainsides earlier today. Um, but that the nice sunny weather, these fall calm fall days in the in the Katmai region are, are some of the best days that you can experience. We're looking at the main Brooks Falls camera right now. It's looking downstream from the falls, but we have other cameras at our disposal that we'll turn to from time to time, like Falls Low Camera, which is located near the main falls camera, just down below it. Uh, we also have the Riffles camera, which is pointed upstream towards the falls, looking at uh, a big guy, number 151 Walker. We have uh, Cats Riverview also, available to us which just came online uh we had uh some we had been waiting that for that one eagerly over the last few days for more solar power to help charge those batteries up and it's looking great today there and also on top of dumpling mountain we have the live view there we also have some clips from the past uh, week or so that maybe we could talk about we have uh, viewer questions as well that were submitted in advance uh to try to try to talk about and give us some plenty of conversation today. Thanks for everyone who's joining us. Uh, I know there's always a few new people joining uh, our, our play by play broadcast. So for those of you who are new to explore.org or the bear cams, let's take a quick tour because Brooks River is located about 300 miles southwest of Anchorage, Alaska on the Alaska Peninsula. And Brooks River itself is pretty short. It's only about a mile and a half long. It's bisected by Brooks Falls. And in this view here, the river flows generally from left to right. Along with our webcam partner, the National Park Service, Explore.org hosts and maintains several webcams at Brooks River. The signal from those webcams is either sent directly to a satellite internet connection, or it's hopped off of a couple of radio repeaters on Dumpling Mountain and then sent to the small town of King Salmon, about 30 miles away. And I wanna show you uh, during the broadcast today, we do have the Naknek River Cam available. So if you're wondering what the town of King Salmon in that area looks like, here it is. So this is live footage from King Salmon, Alaska right now, the Naknek River, all of the salmon that go in the Brooks River swim through here uh, in, in July and increasingly into August. Uh, now, however, uh, let's take let's head back to the river and give you a, a better look at what or where specifically the the cameras are located. We have the Brooks Falls camera again, right at Brooks Falls. It'll often look directly across at Brooks Falls, but it also looks downstream a, a couple hundred yards or so from time to time. Riffles camera is live as I mentioned before, and that one looks across the river and upstream to Brooks Falls. And then we also have the final camera on the river, Cats River View, which right now is located on the south side of Brooks River near the river mouth and gives us a pretty great perspective on the lower half of Brooks River. We're going to answer, again, some people's uh, questions that were submitted in advance. Thanks to everybody who did submit their questions in advance. But I also want to thank everybody personally 
who donated to the Otis Fund during our annual uh, campaign, uh, fundraising campaign for the Katmai Conservancy this year. Uh, you donated collectively more than $300,000 to Katmai National Park, which is an incredible amount of money, I must admit, for a park that has such few staff like Katmai. That, that money can go a long, long way into doing good at a national park that maybe only has like maybe 30 uh, year round employees. So thanks to everybody who did that. But before uh, these bears, you know, maybe the one or two bears that we're seeing consistently on the cameras disappear, let's get back to them. And Rangers, yeah, I'll let you, um, you know, discuss this uh, big dude here. He's one of the one of the bigger uh, brown bears on Brooks River, number 151 Walker. Looking good. He, he's, he's a very handsome bear and um, I think learned some patience from, o from Otis. He forgets it sometimes, but it's got to be pretty patient to be hanging out there at this time of year. Look like he's been putting his time to good use. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, I love fall bears. His coat looks so good. He's so He's so fat. Oh, it's like we we often we have to leave during the best time of the year when the bears are all fat and really good looking, and oh, they put in so yeah. much work. Okay, let's go back. Yeah, <laughs> field trip. <laughs> and I think uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of people who would like to be at Brooks River at this time of the year to see. Um, you know, not only the big guys like Walker, but also as we head down the Cats Riverview, um, uh, bear families are still hanging out along the river. This looks like a mother bear and some first year cubs, or at least one first. Could it be the 910 group, that flathead there? Looks like, uh, yeah, the, you know, the mother is on the left and then Cub trailing behind looks too small for uh, 910s cubs, which are, uh, if you're not familiar with that family, they are two and a half years old. And uh, there's a yearling cub there. So 910 adopted a two and a half year old this year. This looks like a, a first year cub though, Naomi. Yeah, it does. Look, at, Looks like a healthy first year cub. Felicia or Chris, do um, either of you have maybe a uh, an educated guess or a confident ID of who this bear might be? I know 901, she had three cubs at the beginning of summer. She had, um, you know, two cubs at the end of, uh, or one or two cubs, yeah, I think at the end of September, and then one cub of one of her last pair disappeared recently. I'm not sure if this could be her. I'm not sure. I thought hers was a little bigger than that, but um, it could be 901. I, I've seen mm, yeah. 811. I've seen 811 and 273 on the cams. But 811 has a springer, right? Um, according to my mm. uh, cheat sheet, uh, she had uh, a yearlings this year. Oh, yeah. Okay. I can't keep track. Too many cubs in the last couple of years. Oh, there's no <laughs> such thing as too many cubs. <laughs> You're right. I knew that as soon as I said that. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it can be difficult year, to like, keep track. Like she was saying, they're all fat. <laughs> and, you know, uh, and I understand the difficulty in keeping track because I just counted um, in my cheat sheet and it's something like 18 or 19 litters, separate litters this year, which is a oh. lot to keep track of if you don't have it all down on paper, including, let's see, one, uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine litters of first year cubs. Yeah. Talk about a healthy ecosystem. You don't think it's 806, do you? With our Titanic. That's a distinct possibility. Yeah. That, yeah. you know, the, 
the look at the face that we had earlier that um, I think that's a that's a good option 806 um, uh, an adult female is, I think this is her second litter overall um, she was yeah. identified earlier this year with a single um, with a single spring cub divot also had a single spring cub this year but this does not this bear's face is not divots and I know if you're new to watching the bear cams it can be really difficult to tell the bears apart but divot to me uh rangers always has a she's always had a really distinctive face uh for me 806's face is distinctive in its own way but maybe less at least in my mind it's less distinctive than uh than divots so when you're when you're identifying bears especially bear families what are the things that you're looking for i pay a lot of attention well, to ears yeah ears <laughs> and behavior for me I mean, that always helps me a lot. But I think Chris may be right about 806. I don't know. She always has that kind of, you know, that furry frame to her face. But um, you know what I say? Who cares? I mean, these are great looking <laughs> bears and fun to watch. They are. Mm. I always look at the face if I try to ID a bear too. Um, like zoom into their face and like their nose shape and then where their eyes are at and try and look for those distinctive markings. Like Divot does have a very clear face that I look for. And brown bears are interesting in that way. In that their, their facial structure differs considerably from bear to bear. And I think that maybe helps us as humans because humans are just really good at recognizing faces. So at first, when you look at bears, you're just like, oh, well, that's just a bear. But when you take a really close look, and especially through our webcams, when we get good views of them, you can see that there are distinct differences uh, between the individual bears. Uh, you know, spring cubs may be less so, but Walker, uh, you know, to me, he's still hanging up at Brooks Falls. He has that sort of a very conical shaped face, um, you know, sort of Mickey Mouse ears on him. As he grows bigger, those ears are becoming smaller. So maybe that's not as distinctive as it was uh, before. But th to me, those are the things that I'm looking for when I'm identifying Walker, besides his like light bulb shape. It's really kind of like that. It's all in the face uh, for me when I'm yeah. looking at him. And he has a kind of turned up nose, you know, kind of narrow turned up nose and, you know, tape, very tapered nose. So he, he's a bear that's pretty easy for me to identify. Not all the bears are, but um, I can, can pick out Walker pretty quickly. And um, he looks great. That's, is that the Riffles cam, Mike? Yes, yeah, we're back to the Riffles camera right now. So Riffles looking upstream to Brooks Falls, Walker in the far pool. Such a great view. It looks like our Mother bear is maybe moving back into an area of the river where we can see her a bit more clearly. So, you know, walkers up at the falls waiting for salmon. This um, family group down here is l looking for salmon a bit more actively. So how does the, you know, how does the, the, what's, how does the strategy between, you know, walker at the falls differ from, um, this mother bear why wouldn't she just be sitting in the water i think she's probably take that looking at, uh yeah i was gonna say it was probably just like we talked about earlier maybe the dead and dying salmon or less energy is expended to find them where a walk is spending a lot of time just sitting looking for fish up there i think she's using her time a little more uh cautiously since she has the cub to look after Mm, yeah, I would agree with that. Like, even though it's late October and there aren't, you know, as many males out there, other bears around, I think it's still a pretty dangerous spot to have a cub. Um, so probably her best bet is lower in the river, closer to the bridge where the salmon are washing up and dying anyway. Yeah, and and Walker's waiting to get live salmon up there. Yeah, there's the the element of um, safety that bears can experience in the lower river. 
because there's just so much more space to spread out to avoid other bears. There's the factors of the dead and dying salmon at this time of the year, which are collecting in the slow moving waters near the river mouth. And they're not really doing that at the falls because the current's just strong enough to sweep all of those spawned out salmon away. Uh, but Walker, you know, he's a big guy. He really doesn't have to worry about other bears displacing him most of the time, especially when there's not a lot of, of, of bears fishing at Brooks Falls. He, he basically has, if we look at our, our falls low cam, he's on the uh, right-hand side tucked up in the corner of the falls there. He has the whole falls to himself. I don't think anyone's noticed any fish jumping in quite a while, but there could still be some in the river. Yeah, I have seen bears been ca have been catching fish up there. Not not fish jumping, but live fish. There are definitely I, I think... like salmon making reds. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to mention that point too, Felicia, because um, earlier today, when right around the time when Cats Riverview went live, it was pointed kind of more towards the water right below the camera. Uh, and you could see fish, salmon hanging out in that spot. So uh, yeah, it's, so I, th I think there's still plenty of um, fish in certain areas. It's a matter of like whether or not the bears are able uh, to catch them, you know, how energetic the fish are. It's been interesting it to me like this week how many um, family groups have stayed around. What have you been seeing? Well, I've been seeing um, 910 and um, 811 and um, just, you know, f f um, and 708, um, different f and 273. So seeing a lot of family groups still on the river. Has 856 eight, still been seen at the falls? I haven't seen him when I've been watching. I haven't seen him. No, I haven't seen him either. Uh, but I, I wonder, you know, with the families, if, you know, their, their energetic demands overall might are just kind of like higher than a single bear so you know many of the, many of the other bears maybe you know at a point where they're like you know i'm kind of fat enough <laughs> i can move on and a mother bear she may be you know more energetically taxed uh and she you know maybe she feels like she needs to eat more or she feels like hey i need to eat more for my cubs um, because they're maybe they're still nursing or you know they're smaller bodied overall so they can't carry as much fat as like a full as a full grown bear and i you know it's i remember going out to brooks river in late october one year and just for the day and like the only bears i saw was 402 and like her two or three spring cubs i can't remember exactly what year it was but to see family groups hanging around the river i that's that's my hypothesis anyways you know maybe we're seeing a high proportion of them right now compared to the single bears just because you know, the, the energetic needs of a bear family is greater proportionally than what you find with, with just Walker. Yeah, he can go Betty by right now. He could have gone to sleep a month ago and he would have been fine. <laughs>
And I wanted to check Cat's Riverview. It looks like, uh, yeah, those lumps there are not bears. I thought maybe that was a resting bear. It looks like just some pieces of sod hanging out. The water level is also dropping a lot, uh, Rangers, compared mm -hmm. to, you know, what you maybe saw when you left. So uh, if we have any, you know, new viewers joining us for Fat Bear Week, what's, you know, what's the water level typically like in September and how does that change going into this month? Uh, it's a lot higher than what it looks like now. Like I know when we were just back at the uh, falls cam, um, that like little spot that used to be an island um, in like September, in early September, especially there was maybe like a sliver of land there. But now it looks like it's like a pretty substantial chunk of the middle of the river that is exposed. Um, so it's definitely dropped quite a bit. I know whenever we show up in May every year, like I'm always amazed at just like how low the river is. And then when the snow melts, obviously, um, you know, that water level builds up, but um, it's starting to drop. Yeah, and we can't take boats out to Brooks Camp until the water level is high enough because um, there's a lot of rocks out there that could take out the bottom of those boats. So water levels going back down. Yeah, and um, I think that, yeah, the Dumpling Mountain Cam is gonna pan towards Naknek Lake here in just a second. Because, it, you know, we, speaking of like the depths of the water, Naomi, um, parts of Naknek Lake are extremely deep like um you know the iliac arm that we're looking at right here places in there are more than 500 feet deep but when you get towards the western end of naknek lake so basically in the opposite direction of where our camera is looking at that uh, part of the lake averages like less than 30 feet or something like that and then where naknek river empties out of naknek lake i mean there's just the you know, boulders, glacial boulders everywhere sticking out of the water in the springtime. Um, it looks a little bit deeper in King Salmon, but there's still uh, a lot of navigational hazards if you are operating a boat or, you know, the smaller the boat, maybe the easier it is. But um, with the, the big like park landing crafts and things like that, it can be a challenging endeavor to get through the head of uh, head of the river uh, trying to get into Knock Knock Lake and to Brooks Camp. I think there were years um, prior where those of us who migrate in September that we were unable to use one of the boats, um, the queue, because the water level had dropped so um, into September that we weren't able to use that, which we were fortunate enough to use this year. But I think the water level de definitely decreases as we head into September and October. This area downstream of the of the falls where the current begins to slow is an area that's really abundant with spawning salmon and it seems to be a popular area with bears right now looking for the last of the year's um, salmon. like Walker gave up on the falls and is heading into the riffles. I guess we shouldn't be too surprised, right? Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> this time of the year, the, the, the catch rates are much, much higher um, farther downstream. Uh, and salmon, of course, underpin the productivity of Katmai's ecosystems, They're the keystone of the ecosystem itself. They're the reason why the park supports some of the highest densities of bears ever measured and Brooks River attracts dozens and dozens of bears each summer. Uh, but somebody was wondering, and maybe I can throw this out to, um, you know, maybe uh, Chris or Felicia, I know that you 
both of you love to talk about salmon, but uh, somebody was wondering why do the salmon die? So we talk about them coming from the ocean into freshwater to spawn. And then when they spawn, that's it for them. They don't go back out to the ocean. So, so why are the salmon spawning and then dying? Uh, Chris, do you want to take that with us first? <laughs> sure. Um, that's the way I look at it is a life cycle. And so um, they die because they, when they're born and they're in fresh water, they take their time and they work their way and uh, acclimate into the salt water where they spend a couple of years. But when they come back in um, to migrate back into their original rivers, they stop eating and they never really adjust back to the fresh water. So from the time they enter the fresh water, they're pretty much dying and they work their way into the rivers um, to spawn. And that's what their goal is. And um, so they die because number one, that's they're just stopped eating. And so um, they can't sustain themselves. And two, that is their life cycle where they spawn and then they die. So you can add to that, Felicia, or... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, to add on it, um, it's their reproductive strategy. Um, salmon are semiparous animals, so that means they only spawn once. Um, they only reproduce once and then they die versus like bears or iteroparous animals. So they can have, um, they reproduce multiple times in their lives. Um, and when an iteroparous animal has, you know, multiple, um, you know, they they reproduce multiple times, they're going to produce less offspring um, so that they can put their energy into reproducing multiple times. Salmon are semiparous, so they their strategy is put all of their energy into having making a lot of babies at one time. And then, you know, after spawning um, and laying all of those eggs, um, they, they're spent. They're spent from the just act of reproduction itself, um, the migration where, like Chris said, they don't eat. Um, and they, you know, that's their entire life cycle. So for salmon, it's just this like one time thing. I'm going to bank and put all of my eggs into this literal basket. Um, and after that, I'm done. Hmm. And, and Mike, what's the percentage of survival of those eggs? I know it's pretty small. Did we lose Mike or did he put himself on mute? I don't know. He <laughs> might have. Um, well, have the numbers um, so in that inner pair i mean that simple pair is life cycle right salmon each female can have you know thousands of eggs um you know maybe maybe ten thousand but only a few will survive i think some crazy number like 10 10 out of I a think, thousand eggs will survive i think it's i think the number is two percent i think two percent around yeah. around two percent survive No. Yeah, so very few so, make it to like the fry stage, uh, which we're looking at here. This is footage from Brooks River in the springtime, where there's some like newly hatched um, sockeye in the mm -hmm. river. Uh, and then, you know, even fewer of those will return as as uh, sockeye salmon in uh, in July. And some of those will get picked off by the bears. If you make it to Brooks River, in July as a, as a salmon, it's quite likely you're going to make it to spawning just because, uh, you know, the bears don't catch all of the fish itself. But compared to, I mean, the odds really do seem, I think it's a, a great thing to think about. The odds really seem to be against, you know, an individual salmon egg overall making it back to spawn as an adult. But when you compare that to, Felicia, like what you're saying with, um, I don't know, comparing and contrasting that to like cod, which are like broadcast spawners, mm -hmm. like out in the ocean, they're just like broadcasting like hundreds of thousands of eggs. Uh, <laughs> and it's extraordinarily unlikely any of those eggs survive. Um, but, but salmon, you know, they, they devote, you know, much more energy into like this single, single event.
And think of all the think of all the obstacles that they face to get there throughout their life cycle. Yeah, as soon as they emerge from the gravel, everything wants to eat them. The fish, for uh, diving birds, uh, other uh, uh, out in the ocean, it's sharks, orcas, beluga whales, people, of course, people in freshwater, people in saltwater fishing for them. They get back. It's also the brown bears, the eagles. If you are a fish, uh, a salmon, you are targeted. There's probably like no safe time in your life, essentially, except for that maybe that period of time where you're buried in the gravel in the winter. That gives me so much anxiety thinking about that. Like, <laughs> that's why they have so many eggs. <laughs> right. And a good catch by this bear here, um, again, scavenging dead and dying salmon. We didn't get a really great look at the fish itself uh, before the bear pulled its skin off, but I thought I saw it, uh, kind of a yellowed tail on on that salmon. So uh, that to me indicates that this is, this is a fish that had already spawned and it's done its life's work. Um, it beat itself up on the gravel trying to dig a nest or you know defending its nesting site or if it, if it was a male. Uh, fighting with other males for access to females. And now it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a triumphant salmon, even, even in death. I like that. I know people like it, it's so easy to feel so bad for the salmon, like when they're getting ripped apart by bears and it's like, yeah, I definitely feel for the salmon, but also they're, if they reach that point, like they're winning. The salmon have fulfilled their life's mission. They're successful and they're making the bears successful with their sacrifice. Like good job, salmon. Yeah, I feel the same way. And just the deterioration in the water as nutrients and uh, it gets carried into the forests and uh, salmon just make such a great contribution to the ecosystem. This time of the year too, along the edge of the river, it's just covered with salmon parts. Like uh, often people ask us, uh, you know, is it smelly there <laughs> throughout the summertime <laughs> with like all the bears eating salmon and during, like bear scat, can smell especially when they're eating a lot of salmon um and it's it's very loose scat it's like it's basically like diarrhea when they're eating a lot of a lot of salmon so it's 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 quite gross uh for me the the river never really had an unpleasant smell though until like this like in, into october this is like when when you had not only all the the bare scat everywhere but you also had uh the dead fish parts everywhere um, so, you know, you think about like clean, pristine Alaska water, which it is in, in many ways, but it's, it's not like, uh, you know, something that you would, you would want to dip your water bottle in and, and just, uh, and, and chug mm -hmm. away. Well, I have you had know, visitors um, notice before around the, um, around the falls platform and, uh, the falls trail where not only are they, uh, defecating, but also they're dragging their fish out underneath the walkways and everything where people have mentioned before that it smelled rather bad and uh said yeah that's kind of what salmon smells like so um <laughs> i think especially now down river it's going to smell a little more like that yeah you know what's interesting to me here is you know we're seeing ravens around this bear and Usually bears don't let the ravens get very close. They have a low tolerance of ravens, but it's reminding me that I've been seeing all kinds of birds on the river. Um, I mean, the other day there were a lot of juvenile eagles and we, you know, we hardly saw any juvenile eagles this summer. So um, another thing to be watching on the cams is for the birds. Brooks River is one of the last places in um the watershed where salmon still spawn at this time of the year so it 
it doesn't surprise me that there's a, you know maybe juvenile eagles visiting the river especially if they've you know just fledged from the nest this year they're going to be looking for you know the last of the food uh, a lot of those smaller gulls in the foreground i think are bonaparte's gulls which yeah. uh, you know aren't you know a bear that or excuse me a bird that we see much of like in july um glaucus wing gulls mew gulls are going to be much more common uh since we were on the the topic though of scents then we can't smell the river through the cams maybe uh one or all of you could describe what a bear smells like because somebody was wondering are the bears smelly <laughs> given the way they urinate and get fish all over their faces and chests while eating does the river clean it off well, you really well, can't get very close to them. <laughs> I know. So. I mean, I think the answer to that is if you're close enough to smell the bear, you've got other things to worry about. Yeah. It does not, you know, <laughs> at 50 yards away, you really can't smell them too well, you know. <laughs> I think bears are gross. They're smelly. <laughs> On sometimes. <Lisa>. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are. They're pretty gross. We like that doesn't mean I don't love them. They're just pretty gross. <laughs> but I think <laughs> I think um like <laughs> if if it's like especially like late in the season and there's like a ton of fish all over the place um and it's like I've worms. been on a viewing platform and like I have I don't know if I have a good sense of smell or something but I sometimes smell the bear before I see them um because you smell the fish like a hundred percent you smell the fish for sure well you must be related to a bear you have a good sense of smell <laughs> yeah, I can't say I've ever actually noticed that they I've been close that I've been close enough to actually notice that they smell bad or anything or maybe when I'm close enough to a bear the last thing I'm thinking about is how they smell what they smell like <laughs> They're gross. I'm going to quote they have, a, they have a smell. <laughs> <laughs> they have a distinct, I think the nice, what she's trying to say nicely is they have a distinct smell. <laughs> we still, we still love them. We still love them. That just means they're eating well. They're, they're, they're getting their fish. They're getting that salmon oil and sometimes it gets on their coats and we can smell it. <laughs> It does change uh, depending on the time of the year too, because when they're eating like grass in the springtime, you know, that that's not really something that's going to make them odorous. Even the bear scat in the springtime doesn't really have much of an odor that I have noticed. It's really once they start eating the fish, you know, they're covered in fish gore a lot. And of course the water, I think does help to rinse a lot of that off, but still, I mean, it gets worked into them. Um, you, if you, you talk to people who like, um, you know, maybe have, hunted bears uh, from the Alaska Peninsula, like maybe some um, indigenous peoples or something like that. They might even talk about how, uh, depending on the time of the year, the bear fat can have like a, a fish odor to them. Um, and uh, and uh, so, yeah, I think when they're just covered in fish gore, they can be kind of smelly. And if they lay under the platforms at the, at the, at the, at the river, then sometimes that's an opportunity for, you know, you to catch a whiff of them. Or if you investigate sort of like their belly holes, their resting places, like on the beaches and things like that, after they've left, there can be a lingering odor there. It's almost like, you know, how, you know, the beds of people or like a car, for instance, if you've been sitting in a car for a long time and, um, you know, it, it kind of picks up the funk of you. And I think that <laughs> that can happen for those spots where they rest in the forest mm -hmm. and on the beach. I have this vision of, of you, Mike, smelling belly holes there's somewhere out there there's some um screen captures of me from a, like a live chat a long time ago where we were where i was in a belly hole um so bear camp fans can find that and share that if, if they want so it, it it does whatever gets put on the internet never dies just remember that everybody <laughs> uh you know we're more than halfway through our broadcast thanks for joining us today uh my name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. I'm joined by Katmai National Park Rangers, Naomi Boak, Felicia Jimenez, and Chris Kleesrath. Uh, we're talking about brown bears and salmon and many things related to them at Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. There's a mother bear and her cub on camera right now. But before um, we run out of time, Rangers, there are some uh, 
some other things that have been that have happened over the last week that I think might be worth talking about. And one happens to be a bear that we saw back in it was like late July. We saw a bear that looked like it had a wire snare hanging around its neck. And then also that bear showed up uh, like about 10 days ago or so, or so at Brooks River. At least we think it might be uh, the same bear. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about like whether, you know, when, when it's appropriate for, um, or first of all, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, if we know what happened to this bear. So we know it showed up on October 8 again, uh, had gained body weight it looked like. So looking like it wasn't starving at all. It seems like it did put on a, a good bit of, of body mass. And we've had some uh, several questions um, ab about that. So let me bring up one of those questions real quick. So I think we can, we've, you know, we've answered this one early in the summer. There was an unknown bear spotted with a snare around his neck. Does anyone know what happened to it? So we know that it was seen again. Uh, but can you talk to us, and uh, Naomi, it looks like you've been talking to rangers recently. Uh, some of them went out to Brooks River to look for this bear. Can you fill us in? Yeah, so when um, bear cam viewers spotted the bear, um, we, we alerted um, bear uh, Michael Saxton, who is a uh, um, bear management and a bear biologist, and also um, our district ranger, uh, Kathy Dalrymple. And um, so they were alerted. Unfortunately, the bear was spotted over the holiday weekend on a Sunday. So, um, but we but we tracked people down. And, um, and so they went out that Thursday to do a, a real good search for that bear and they were prepared to help it. Now, if you're prepared to help a bear that may have a snare around its neck. I mean, you've got to be prepared to sedate it, which is tricky. So um, it it took them some time to um, gather the equipment and um, personnel that they needed to do that. But they searched and they, um, they really did a thorough search and could not find the bear. And um, this is an instance when we will try to help a bear because um, if that is a snare around its neck, that's damage caused by humans. And that's when we will try to help the bear and intervene. If a bear um, injures its leg or gets porcupine quills in its paws or nose, we're not gonna do anything about that. That's a, a wild bear in the wild um, and being injured by natural causes. Um, but I do want to thank the people on the, who were watching the cams and saw the bear. It's, it's great that you alerted us and the, um, the rangers really tried but couldn't find the bear. And it's not a bear that's been hanging out at the river. And we could say, oh, yeah, well, that's 151. And, you know, he's going to be hanging out at the office and, and we can easily find him. But um, they did try. Yeah, and Chris or, or Felicia, do you have anything to add too about like the the policy of like the National Park Service or and Count My National Park specifically about you know stepping in to help uh, bears that are obviously injured or ill? I know for me, it's not pleasant to watch an injured bear, but we see a lot of instances where bears push through uh, you know what looks to be like significant injuries. And they just make it. It's it's um, they're they're remarkably tough animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I think also something to think about. Um, you know, it's difficult to watch a bear. You know suffering um or in pain and the like i understand the need of like wanting the park to step in or offering veterinary care um but it can be oftentimes more traumatic for a bear a wild bear to get sedated um and treated than just dealing with the injury on their own um 
it's it you have to um there's a lot of train people that need to do it um they have to be sedated and oftentimes a bear can die when they're sedated um if something goes wrong there are a lot of complications that can happen um and it's not you know that's not something that's you know very well known to people but there's a risk of that for bears um so for the park to step in and sedate a wild bear and treat it, there has to be um, some kind of like special circumstance, right? So um, like a human caused injury. So if this bear did have a snare on its neck, um, that would be something that humans had caused um, versus a natural injury that the bear would get. So the um, it's it's a little bit more worth it to sedate that bear and treat that bear versus let the bear, you know, um, heal from that injury on its own. And of course, the best example we have of a successful one is bear 854 divot, who did have a snare around her neck, was sedated and had it removed and treated and was able to recover from that. But again, that was a human caused problem. And that's why they stepped in at the time. And here she is from earlier this year. Uh, Felicia, I think this is your picture from July or something like that. So it's always great <laughs> to see Divot around because she's doing really well for herself. She's had a, um, at least two litters, maybe three since um, since that, that wire snare was removed from around her neck. With the bear uh, at Brooks River that we saw with the wire snare, we don't know where he got it. The trapping is not permitted within Katmai National Park and I don't think people trap for bears with things like this. So this probably was a snare that was targeting another animal. Um, I'm not even anymore since I've moved away from Alaska. I'm not sure of the seasons anymore. Uh, but yeah, was, you know, I think it's more likely than not that this bear wandered outside of park boundaries. Uh, and then that's where it ran into this, this problem. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a lesson uh, for all of us that, that goes to show how animals don't recognize our political boundaries. They really don't have any conception of that. They have conceptions of the tolerance of people for um, in certain areas. They they know when people are, are dangerous and the seasons when people are dangerous, for example, like there's, you know, uh, you know, hunters know that deer act differently during deer hunting season than they do the rest of the year, right? So um, I'm sure bears have that capacity as well, but bears wander outside the park boundaries um, quite a bit. And then also, um there was a bear seen uh the past few days at brooks river that didn't seem to have um an injury caused by people um an injury caused by bears though but this is a very significant injury to this bear's nose uh, i have never seen this bear in person rangers i don't know have have any of you seen this bear we know he's identified as number 299 uh, but i've never seen him in person I don't know that I've seen him in person either. Mm -mm. I don't think I've seen this bear. I mean, a good example of resilience in bears. And, and like Felicia mentioned, when people say, oh, that poor bear is injured and, and yeah, and it's hard to see an injured bear, but um, there's, there is a big risk to help the bear. I mean, sedation is not an easy thing and bears can survive a lot. And this bear has a significant injury on its nose and on its um, forehead and shoulder. And um, look at it, I mean, it's, it's healthy. Yeah, this is a pretty big bodied bear. And especially like the the risk of sedation is even greater for bears near water bodies. So like if you were to, you know, try, try to tranquilize a bear right where these are in this clip here, uh, it's that bear could run into the water and the tranquilizer could take effect before it's out of the water, or it may just go into the river and stay there because it feels like it's safer there than fleeing into the forest. Um, and, and bears can drown in those situations. Back in the 1970s, when they were doing some um, tracking studies at Brooks River that did happen to some bears. So I know now uh, biologists, when they feel like they need to take that risk, they're careful about it. With Divot, when we rescued her in 2014, we did tranquilize her near uh, the shoreline of Naknek Lake. 
uh, just because there was a lot of people watching at that time and we felt like hey this is we might not get another shot at this we need to help her now uh, but i talked to the lead biologist who was who was running that um that effort and he said you know in a normal circumstance there's no way he would have done that so had it been just for like a a normal study where they were looking at um attaching like a, a gps collar or, or something like that they would not have ever you know attempted something like that so close to water because of the risk of of a bear drowning uh, but this bear number 299 uh yeah, I mean, you can see in this clip how, how damaged his nose is. Um, and this is an injury that he's had for uh, several years, at least since 2017. Um, looking at my notes, so he was first identified in the bear monitoring records in 2021, but there's really good evidence that he had used the river for several years before that. Um, so... We, you know, th these photos of him in 2021, really the only time he's shown up in September. And the quality of these photos are kind of grainy, which is typical of what happens in September, just low light, bears are far away. But you can see that pretty significant damage to that nose. But yeah, Naomi, you were mentioning resilience and toughness of bears. You know, this probably was a, a bear, I think, that was injured in a fight, but it, um, it seems to be doing quite well for itself uh, this year, despite those those uh, injuries. We see so many examples of that. Um, something, something to admire about bears. A lot of things that we couldn't survive, and they and they survive. And again, if you're wondering, you know, who this bear might be, we know him as number 299. And he's one of those bears that really only shows up in October, usually after the bear monitoring sessions are done for the year. Those typically end right around like October 5 or something like that. So he's a bear that shows up really late at Brooks River. I don't know if he's habituated to people. Probably, you know, his late arrival might indicate that you know, he doesn't want to use the river when people are around. And there are, there's a, there's a cohort of bears like that, that no matter how benign the in, repeated encounters between hu the human and the bear can be, there are some bears that just never get tolerant or become tolerant of our presence. So when you're, if you visit Brooks River in the future, try to keep that in mind too, uh, because there are bears that, there are some bears that are like, oh yeah, I'm really habituated to you. And uh, your, you know, your presence really doesn't weird me out, but there are other bears that do get quite weirded out uh, by by people, and, and a lot of those bears that come in the fall, especially. And we have a few minutes left in our broadcast, Rangers. There's one more clip that I want to go to. Uh, transitioning away from bears for just a moment because we do see other wildlife on the cameras and before the broadcast we were debating about what this animal is i think there's a, a variety of opinions on that <laughs> let's cut to this clip uh, it's going to be in slightly slower motion than real time so we can get a better look at it um, but this uh, comes from our dumpling mountain cam and i think this was this morning if i remember correctly small i think it's a small canine running in front of the camera some people said wolf and it there's a lot of wolves in katmai most of the time i think when we see a canine on the cameras it is a wolf uh in this instance though it just doesn't seem as robust enough to be a wolf i'm leaning towards coyote or maybe even fox uh but with it's so hard to get a sense of scale uh, from this perspective because you're looking at tundra you're looking at a sunrise the edge of the mountain i wonder yeah what what did the three of you think about this? I was thinking I look at the a small wolf. Yeah. Yeah. I look at that tail and I see fox. But you know, it is it is hard to tell. Mm, it looks too big to me to be a fox. It's a nice bushy tail, but I don't know. Like I can see where the coyote would come from, but I I think it's just a scrawny wolf because like all the wolves that I've seen in Katmai are small. Okay, well, three, four people 
on four different answers. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, American fans, take that, uh, you know, you know, with uh, do what what you what you want with with that information. I yeah, I'm I'm leaning towards uh, definitely like towards Coyote or even Fox, um, but. Again, sense of scale, so hard to tell here. I am happy to be proven wrong in, in these situations. So maybe next week or next year or something like that, somebody will come up with and come back with more information, be like, you know what, Mike? Uh, those other people were right. So <laughs> don't know. But right. yeah, our sharp eyed viewers <laughs> caught this this morning. I mean, it was only on the camera for an instant. That's at 50% speed of normal time. Uh, I'm playing it right now. So um, yeah, Sherpa viewers, nothing gets by them. Thanks for catching that on the Dumpling Mountain cam uh, this morning. They see everything. Um, well, but you know, this is also harkens back to a lesson that um, I have learned at Katmai, which is it's okay to say, I don't know. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's one of the best answers that you can give people. If people try to, um, I guess, uh, to put it bluntly, if they try to BS their way through <laughs> through answers that they don't know the questions, or the, the you know through questions they don't know the answers to, then that's a bad sign. So, if you are asking a ranger a question and they say, "I don't know," that's a good thing, um, and the ranger often will try to find that that information. started the broadcast with Walker. It looks like maybe we'll end the broadcast with Walker as he continues to head downstream. If this is indeed him earlier, maybe I lost track of where he went. This could be another, another big bodied, um, similar colored brown bear on the river. Got to see his nose to see if it's Walker for me. Oh yeah, it's Walker. Yeah, so I guess he just happened to circle back around. Which bears are apt to do. Again, they're searching places where salmon get stuck. They get caught as they're drifting downstream after they spawn. They're hanging out at the river mouth. Good look at a young bear here. This might be a cub actually, just based on its, uh, its overall size. But again, hard to tell, get a sense of scale you know, without like another bear in the picture or something else like human made that we have exact dimensions for. But uh, Naomi, you said before the broadcast that uh, the 910 family was hanging out. Yeah, um, yeah, 910 family and um, 273811. I mean, lots of family groups, it's been fun. Um, and also um, by, um, the bear monitors stand. They've been out there at the cut bank, a number of family groups. We're just about out of time, but I, I do want to uh, take a moment to thank the rangers that I'm talking to today who have helped out um, all summer with a variety of things, especially with the bear cams. Naomi and Chris, their seasons are ending soon. So unless something happens over the next you know, couple of days, this is likely to be their last bear cam broadcast of the year. Uh, so thank you very much, Naomi and Chris. It's been, um, it's been great working with you uh, once again. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Mike. It's always great. And um, yeah, I'm feeling a little sad. This is the last play-by-play. -play. <laughs> Our season ends Friday. But yes, Felicia will be here. It. Felicia will be here. You can do some more plays with Felicia. We'll watch. Yeah, I <laughs> I did want to leave that open as a possibility. I think, you know, going forward next week, it depends on the bear activity. If we have this many bears, then I think I'll try to do a play by play next week. Uh, because there's there's definitely plenty to talk about. We have plenty of audience questions. So lots of things to discuss. Um, so yeah, Felicia will be will be hanging around for just a, um, a little bit longer um, to maybe help out with some of those broadcasts. But Felicia, thank you for joining us today 
and sharing your expertise on uh, this broadcast today. Yeah, thank you. Maybe we'll see you next week. <laughs> and my co-host for this broadcast uh, on Oct what day is today? October 18, 2023, have been Katmai National Park Rangers, Naomi Boak, Felicia Jimenez, and Chris. Chris, please wrath. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. Thanks for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoy the bear cams. And as we like to say at explore.org, never stop learning. I'll talk to you soon. And uh, yeah, enjoy the bears. <laughs>